This episode contains some sensitive topics. Please listen with care. If you're struggling with your pension, you're not alone. Luckily, Pension B is on a mission to help. Every month, join me, Philip Alam, with a panel of experts on the Pension Confident podcast as we tackle your personal finance questions. From how to talk to kids about money to how your relationship status impacts on your finances, it's all in the podcast. Available right now, wherever you like to get your podcasts. Just keep in mind, though, that anything we discuss should never be regarded as financial advice. And when investing, your capital is at risk. I'm Emily Bellet, and you're listening to The Wallet. We're back and we're doing something different for the next six weeks. This is Banking Bad. Six true crime stories from the world of money. In this episode, I talked to Philip Astor about some very personal financial crimes that occurred within his own family. The victim of the crimes? His elderly grandmother, Brooke Astor. Brooke Astor was a well-known figure in, in New York high society and one of the 20th century's great philanthropists. And she was notoriously glamorous. When she was, let's say, a hundred something, she was in her apartment. She's alone having dinner with her staff, you know, was there. But she would get dressed up. And once she looked at herself in the mirror, she goes, we need to go downstairs. I need to show one of the, one of the doormen how I'm looking. So off they go downstairs. Her dresses were magnificent. Every hair on her head was teased into the perfect place. Her long gloves were regal. And a jewelry collection was unviable. Brooke was a style icon, and she knew it. Can you tell me a little bit more about her? Because she was like a celebrity, a superstar. You know, maybe today I'm thinking, you know, the Paris Hilton, Kim Kardashian. We we have our modern celebrities, uh, but but how how was she? She definitely had star power, and it's so strange because it's not really how she started out. In fact, her family had a pretty bad reputation. Slum lords of New York, real estate and fur trappers. Her father was in the Marine Corps, so he even took the family along when he was assigned to China, Hawaii and Panama. And she was an only child with an incredible imagination. And she loved to read, she loved to write, she loved to draw. And she had much of her own world as they lived in Beijing, and then spent quite a bit of time in the uh, Dominican Republic and uh, also in Haiti and in different places. And what happened is she grew up and got married to my grandfather shortly after her 17th birthday. And that relationship, to put it politely, uh, was abusive. She ended up getting divorced, but uh, in the process, I uh, had her only child, you know, her son, my, my father, as her first and only child. But really sadly, what she agonized over really was that she felt that um, she had basically born a child out of marital rape. And it's, it's so sad. Then she married, quote unquote, her quote, uh, the love of her life, uh, Charles Marshall or Buddy Marshall. Buddy died all too early of a heart attack. And so my grandmother was out there in the social, bereaved, but in the social life of uh, New York. And Vincent Astor, the person who's to become her third husband, was out there and somewhat married with a wife looking for an exit strategy. I think they got married in 1953, year I was born. Vincent had established the Vincent Astor Foundation. And he did it out of his own personal goal to, uh, to quote the, the, uh, the mission, to alleviate human misery. Vincent dies. And what Vincent had done when he died is he had 120 million. And that's back in, you know, the late 50s. Half of that went into a trust for my grandmother's benefit. 
And the board of the Vincent Astor Foundation, as you might imagine, was all male. The male board says, well, Mrs. Astor, you know, my, our condolences. We'll take care of the foundation. You can go off to Baden-Baden for the waters. And because it was in the 60s, you can jet set around. And she goes, no, I am going to be president of the foundation. So at the age of 57, Brooke is suddenly rich, mega rich. She would jump in her limo with her long white gloves on and her signature, one of her signature hats. And she, as president, would go and visit every project in the Bronx, in Harlem, in Staten Island, in Manhattan. Uh, and in essence, as part of the vetting of the Vincent Astor Foundation. She could have just been a lady who launched, and she really wanted to make a difference. I always loved this building. And what everybody loved is that she would show up, even in the scariest neighborhoods of New York, she would wear her white gloves, her Chanel suits, her pearls. Do you work morning? Yes. Till night? I do. Every lunch? Every, every dinner? Yes. Why? Because I like it. Well, I know, but come on. It's a little bit much. I do get exhausted, but I can't help it. I mean, for instance... Well, what you're saying is there's so much to do and yes. so little time? Yes. That's it. And so that I just feel, as long as I'm healthy, I would rather die, as Father used to say, die with your boots on. That's what I would rather do. Your mother said, don't die guessing. <laughs> no, well, I'm not. Brooke always said, money is like money. It's not worth a thing unless it's spread around. She wanted to spend the money on education and children and social services. In fact, over the next three decades, she oversaw approximately $185 million dollars worth of grants to organizations and charities, including the Bronx Zoo, the New York Public Library, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and various charities supporting the homeless. The reality is, from a personal point of view, she was clueless about money. She really didn't have the wherewithal to understand. And this is, I'm saying this, this is on a good day, decades ago, where she just let that you know, be managed by other people. And it's, as you know, because she stepped into uh, that position as president, she was not going to be demure about what she could do on spreading the, the money, but the details were lost on her. Not only is Brooke newly rich and taking on presidential duties, but she's also a doting mother to her son, Anthony. My father did some amazing accomplishments, but, you know... He was with the CIA, for better or worse, for years, and that he then ended up becoming a diplomat, an ambassador. The downside is it was in part, large part, because of my grandmother's con political contributions. He was not a career diplomat. He was a political appointment. But he loved Africa. He had done so much in Africa in the 50s. That would be early, let's say. And then in the 60s and then by the 70s, he was well qualified to be ambassador to uh, uh, Kenya and Trinidad and Tobago uh, separately in the Caribbean. And, and he had done work in Nigeria for decades and had a really fascinating life in that arena. He then came back to New York in the late 70s. But when Brooke starts to show signs of dementia, and at 90 is within a few years of lapsing into Alzheimer's, her son Anthony gains her power of attorney. My father was tied around his mother's apron strings. And then eventually he was tied around her purse strings. And they all got tied up in a Gordian knot. Power of attorney is a legal document that allows someone to make decisions for you or act on your behalf, even if you're no longer able to do or if you no longer want to make your own decisions. He basically made her money from the late 70s on. It's not long before Philip notices something isn't quite right. Let's say this is 2004 or 5. My grandmother, okay, she was sadly in the throes of Alzheimer's. But I was visiting my grandmother, and I think, um, I understand that my father was screening visits. But he had, re he, he had a posted on the, the pantry door a short list of people who could visit my grandmother. And the short list was very short. 
Philip, being one of the very few people on the list, goes to visit her one day. She wrote a few books, and she wrote one about her childhood. And we're not having a conversation, so I'm reading her, you know, her childhood. And I go to put the book back on the shelf, and she looks up in fear and goes, don't take that. It's like, what is going on? You know, it's like, wow, where did this fear come from? And then another time, I'm sitting in their same beautiful varnished uh, or lacquered uh, library, and I look up above the mantel surround. She had a child has some painting called Flags Fifth Avenue. So, and it was her favorite painting. And I look up and I see this photograph of her grandfather up there. I go, where did the painting go? I knew the painting was going to go to the Met. It's like, where did that go? So Philip starts keeping an eye out for anything out of the ordinary. He starts talking to the butlers and maids and nurses to find out if they've seen anything strange going on. And usually my father would make sure that he was with me when I visit my grandmother. Yes, that if that sounds like isolation, it is. And so I was up there alone with my grandmother, and it was late in the evening, let's say seven, and the nurses were shifting. So a a home health aide was leaving for the day, and my grandmother always had a nurse, a, a real an NP nurse, on duty in the evening in case things went wrong. And so they were both there. My grandmother's asleep. Well, then I have the nurses who explained the deprivation and the conditions, and they, they were taking money out of their own pocket to, to buy supplies and things like that, and the food and all this kind of stuff. And so at that point, it's like, I'm doing something. So I hire uh, an attorney for a couple hours. I have this binder with power of attorneys, healthcare proxies, financial material that I'd, that I'd received from staff at the Vincent Astor Foundation. And I took it to a lawyer who said, well, Philip, this is bad. So Philip starts to do some digging, and he realizes that a significant amount of money has been moved around. Checks have been signed, legal documents have been altered. And the person signing off on all this? Oh. His father. My father, at this point, is in his 80s. He's got a younger wife, quite a bit younger wife, who knows she's not going to get anything and if he dies first. So Brooke's son gets a power of attorney changed, giving him control over her wealth. Oof, and my grandmother's signature on that document is over in left field. That may be an expression, an American expression, but she couldn't even sign her name on the line. It's so sad. He started changing her will and started transferring tens of millions of dollars to his control. All this stuff should have raised red flags somewhere along the way. Well, someone did challenge Philip's father once, a secretary. She asked him about a check he had signed, but he said, Well, I can do whatever I want. Who's going to stop me? So you have two options at this point. You can either keep quiet and hope that you inherit some of this money, or you can challenge your father and effectively shatter your family. I, I agree with you that those were the options, but I never thought of any of those, anything as optional. I think, you know, I could have turned a blind eye. Uh, I think I, I could have said, well, if things go the way as planned, um, I would have gained not one million U.S., but a double-digit million, 10 or plus, whatever. I could care less about that. So you decide to take your father down. The battle started. Keep in mind, none of the estate had been settled by then. So there's already still tens of millions of dollars that my grandmother wanted to go to charity that was at risk. And so... Long story short, um, starting in 2009, 
I think there was a six-month criminal trial of my father and one lawyer. My brother and I both testified against my father, our father. Um, there were 70, over 70 witnesses that the people, in, in essence, the Manhattan DA called. My father called no witnesses. Philip gets some answers at the trial, like about that painting that went missing. Well, my father sold it for $10 million and pocketed a commission. He wanted a million dollars because he wanted to buy a yacht. And he was, you know, as described by, as we'll see, the, the uh, Manhattan district attorney, he was using his mother, his mother like a, his own ATM. Slowly, through the testimony and presentation of evidence, Philip starts putting together the pieces that he discovered over the past few years. My father's third wife would say to me, with reference to, you know, my father, you know, she goes, well, he was sent away to school at age eight. And, and she would say, well, he deserved and deserves better. What it meant was uh, my father, you know, my grandmother's influence is waning. This new woman comes into his life that's making him happy. And, and, but knows that if he, quote unquote, and this is testimony provided, you know, in court, if he dies first, I get nothing. Philip tries to keep the trial private, but the press soon gets hold of the story. It is the trial of an 85-year-old man accused of stealing millions of dollars from his ailing mother. She was known as New York City's unofficial first lady, the Grand Dame Brooke Astor. New York City's rich and famous with witnesses such as Henry Kissinger and Barbara Walters. Disaster for Mrs. Astor. The folks who were really helping me tried their best to seal all the proceedings um, from public. And lots of money was spent on this. Personally, as I jumped on the subway going back to Queens and I looked at people reading the paper, I said, well, you know, it's good that people under, understand that if this can happen to Brooke Astor, it can happen to anyone. Finally, it's time for Philip to testify against his father. I came maybe halfway through the trial. I had had plenty of time. And you were face to face with him? I was, we were in court. I am looking at him as I'm testifying. But my message, which got on the front page the next day, um, was, you know, something, my message was, you know, since I wasn't really seeing him or talking to him outside of court, uh, you know, Father, please apologize and seek forgiveness. After six months, the trial comes to an end. Guilty, 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 guilty. My father was convicted on 14 out of 16 counts, and all but one was upheld on appeal. And my father, because one was grand uh, felon, uh, felony, but grand larceny, he ended up, out of a one to three year prison sentence, ended up spending two months in prison, released on parole. But in the parole board, and the parole board saying, well, would you do anything different? And his answer was something to the effect of, I suppose so. That's not seeking forgiveness and apologizing mm -hmm. to his mother, first of all. So who got, who got the money? You know, what happened is my father was going to get the real estate. And we're talking a uh, New York two-story apartment. We're talking a country house, 45 minutes from New York with 40 with 60 some acres, a huge, beautiful structure. And then there was Maine. Um, so he had tens of millions of dollars of real estate that he got. Her assets, her cash assets, her trust assets, I'm not remembering. I kind of think it was about 15 million or something like that, but it would have, could have been more. Uh, the legal fees were outstanding for my father. Um, and, um, and, you know, so, yeah, I'm a little vague on the numbers. They're probably out there somewhere. But the charities did get a lot of what they deserved. 
Did you ever see your father again? You know, I tried to see my father and his third wife. You know, I was remember sitting on the floor of Penn Station, that big echoey Penn Station. Because I didn't know, what am I going to do? Go uptown and visit my father? That would be good. Or jump on the train and, you know, head to Queens, where I think I was staying, or wherever it was. Um, and so I sat there for about an hour trying to, not in discussion, sort of back and forth texting and all this. Uh, you know, I wanted to see my father and his third wife said, well, why do you want to see him? Well, I got it. I understand. You know, I destroyed their life or, you know, I would say when people said to me, well, how can you do this to your father? I go, how could her only child do this to his mother? <laughs> and I'll, you know, but basically I never was, I was denied the opportunity to see my father. And then you dedicated the rest of your life to this day to protecting people from elder financial abuse and promoting elder justice. Can you tell me what you've learned? Uh, you know, I, as I go around speaking on elder justice these days, I say, uh, all too prevalent fraud aside, elder abuse is a betrayal of trust. And, and I'm not focusing on elder abuse. I'm focusing on elder justice. And elder justice is the provision of trust. My grandmother suffered harm. My grandmother was victimized. But uh, if you look at her profile and you get, cast aside the numbers, both her age, the fact she was 105 when she died, but also the money, she fits the profile of who pe uh, people who ostensibly get abused. And sadly, women, and I'm not pulling up the data, but, and I'm not doing this in order, but women are likely to be abused. Women are also, we st in New York City Elder Abuse Center started a helpline for concerned persons. Boy, do I wish that was around in 2006. It is now. It's, it's pilot. It came and went. It was citywide. Now it's statewide. That kind of helpline should be nationwide. After assessing the pilot, you know, over, well over 70% of the people who call saying, I need to help, I, I need help to help somebody who's being abused. Over 70% are women. And, and, and then in terms of my grandmother, she was single, you know, at that point. Uh, and she was isolated. And all these factors, you know, both are um, contextual risk factors, but there are also a lot of contextual supportive factors that can come into play to help both address and arrest abuse, but be proactive toward prevention. That's how I found you through, through Beyond Brook, but now, now it's actually, you know, the Wiser Women's right. uh, Institute for, for a Secure Retirement. So you've, you've inherited this, this superstar title from, from your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> I give it well, to you. <laughs> well, people go, well, you know, how do you relate to your grandmother? It's like, well, we both had, and if I don't pronounce it right, uh, we both had joie de vivre, <laughs> and we both probably like to flirt a bit, and we both just like to really mix with all sorts of people. And we had interest, you know, in very, sort of different, but in terms of art and preservation, uh, conservation and stuff. And so that was fun. But, uh, you know, I feel uh, uh, I have been blessed with this opportunity. So what is there to learn from this story? It's all about having the freedom to make our own money decisions. When someone else is calling the shots with our finances, whether it's a partner, ex, family member, or caregiver, even if we're not living under the same roof, that's a form of financial abuse. This kind of mistreatment can come in many shapes and sizes and can happen to anyone, no matter their age. It might involve pressuring you into taking out money or credit in your name, asking you to prove what you've spent your money on, or using various tactics to control your money. If you're in immediate danger, dial 999. You can also reach out to organizations like Women's Aid and Surviving Economic Abuse. You can also call the financial support line for victims of domestic abuse. And you can find all the resources in the show notes and on Vespot.com. Now there may be instances when you actually need to consider signing over your power of attorney and appoint someone else to act on your behalf, call the attorney. This person will have the legal authority to deal with third parties, such as banks or local council, for example. Some types of power of attorney also give the attorney the legal power to make a decision on your behalf, such as 
you know, where you should live and whether you should see a doctor. As long as you're aged 18 and over and you are capable of making decisions for yourself, that means you have mental capacity, you can set up one at any time. You can choose your attorney and you can also have more than one. Fill in the forms to appoint them and register your LPA, lasting power of attorney, with the office of the public guardian. Remember, if you need help, speak to a solicitor.